Okay. So the point is, and I will talk about it for a minute here before we go on to more fun things. Um, the point of that is, is remember that your, what your goal is with the HTML is to tag your text, is to give the text extra meaning. All right. So that's your idea with the text is to give, uh, or with the HTML, is to give your text extra meaning via these tags. So the text formatting tags <coughs> allow you to point to a specific piece of text and give some extra meaning on it. For example, the classic ones are emphasis. If there's something that is important, you can tag it as being important and then people know that, hey, that's important. So let's look at just a quick example of this. Let's go into, and again, I'm going to do this probably every class. I'm going to go in here and turn file extensions on. And I'm going to emphasize again that even though I'm opening it up in Notepad, this will be the same page that we see when we view it in the browser. So we're just taking two different views of it. When I view it this way or when I open it up in a browser. All right. So this is the same file as this, and it ends in .html. Some people, again, I, I think sometimes get a little confused and they'll give me like a .txt and a .html. Save it as a .html and you're in business. Let's look at a few things. If I want to emphasize something, I can put an EM tag around it. And that says to emphasize that. And by default, it makes it in italics. All right. Now, there actually is an italics tag, and you can use that. I, I believe the book describes situations where you use that as well. It's kind of confusing. But if you're doing it for emphasis, then use the EM tag. Now, by default, the browser puts that in italics. But keep in mind that as we get into CSS, we can change that. Maybe we don't want to emphasize it by having it in italics. Maybe we want to emphasize it by having the font a little bit bigger. All right? Or a different color or a different font. Now, one thing I would say is if you're going to make it a different color, all right, also do something else to it. All right? Um, why do I say that? Pardon me? Well, yeah, that's an excellent point. I wasn't thinking in that direction, but make sure you don't make it look like it's a link. All right, so don't make it blue and underlined, for example. But um, why else would I want to do more than just changing the color of it? Accessibility, exactly. Because there could be people who are colorblind that can't distinguish that particular color that you use. So if I, if I want to say something that's important, this is real important, and I just make it red, for example. People that have certain kinds of color blindness won't be able to see that and won't get the emphasis. If I make it red and italics, red and bold, red and a different font, red and bigger, then people that can see colors will get those two visual cues and they'll know it's emphasized. But people that are colorblind for that particular color that you use will at least get one of those two visual cues and, and they'll still be able to get that somehow that text is different. Um, there's also uh, uh, something that's strongly emphasized I want people to really know I don't have one or two. I have three. So I'll do that. Now one thing I would say is with uh, uh, um, 
very general and very basic design guideline is things that mean the same thing, format them the same way. So for example, I emphasize computer information systems, you know, and that's a, that's a department here at LC. If I listed other departments at LC, I probably would want to format them the same way. All right. In a way, with your design, you're sort of teaching people about your site and how you're formatting things and all that. You know, that's why it's so bad to do something like, again, not to beat a dead horse, but the, the thing of having a, something a text that's blue and underlined. People automatically associate that with links and you're confusing them by doing that. So be consistent in the way that you format things and you're then teaching people that this is how my website acts. All right. If you're inconsistent, then people get confused. All right. You can read a whole bunch of other stuff about text formatting in the book and bring your questions to class as far as the appropriateness of using it. And one of your labs, one of your next labs, I think I asked you to do some text formatting. All right, we're going to talk about images now. All right, this is where we start to get into some really fun stuff. We're going to talk about images. We're going to talk about, depending on the time, um, start to talk a little bit about CSS. Images. First of all, what are some ways that you can obtain images? The internet. All right. And that is acceptable within the context of education, provided you give the source. Let's say you were starting a website for a small business. Strictly speaking, it would be not legal for you to go and simply grab any old picture off the internet. All right. So let's assume that. Let's assume we're making uh, a website for a business that you're starting. How are some ways that you could get images? Okay, stock images. What are stock images? You pay for them. Right. In other words, you can go and if we Google stock images, <laughs> exactly. There's even, there's even some, like I've seen on Tumblr, like memes like women eating salad, looking over their left shoulder, because there's so many stock images that fit the certain mold. But we'll look at, like, person skiing. All right. And I like that one. Yeah, why would anyone use that picture? It looks like someone like laughing at someone that's falling. <laughs> On the other hand, the way she's pointing straight up, that would have to be some vicious hill. Because that's like <laughs> vertical. That's like a vertical drop. It's like she had like the bottom of Mount Everest or something, you know. But anyhow, all right, this guy, yeah. I made it. <laughs> but if you look, you can see and you can go and you can buy this. And then you would then have the right to use it. So that would be one way to obtain images. You know, if you were making, let's say, a, a, a site uh, devoted to fitness, for example, you might not want to fly to Vermont or Colorado to take pictures uh, of that. And you could use a stock photo. All right? The, the disadvantage of this, of course, is it costs. You've got to pay for it. All right? Um, there are royalty-free images. In other words, that you pay for, you can use it regardless, and you don't have to pay royalties. Like, for example, if you made it your book cover, if you published a book, you know, the person that, that took the photo wouldn't get, like, a cut of every sale. You just pay them once for the photo, and that's it. All right, and it's, you don't have to pay royalties on it. All right? So that's one way to get it, is through stock photos. By the way, the Internet ruined stock photography for professional photographers, by the way, because now any amateur photographer can go and offer their photos for sale for a fraction of what, like, the pros used to charge. You know, it was basic supply and demand. The internet made the supply go through the roof, so what happens to the price? It drops. All right, what's another way other than stock photos? I would say, well, there's the obvious one, <laughs> take your own, you know. 
If, for example, you were doing a fitness website and you did go skiing, provided you had the ability or a friend that had the ability and the proper equipment to take a good quality picture, you go take your own picture. Then you own the copyright of it. Question, what do you have to do to copyright an image? Watermark it? No. What? What does the copyright law say? When do you get the copyright of an image according to the law? When you take it. The instant you take the picture, it's copyrighted. Now, to your point, if I don't do anything, if I don't, you know, publish it somewhere with my name on it and all that, if someone were to steal it, it might be hard to prove in court that it's yours, you know. So you can do things to, to make it easier to enforce your copyright, all right. But, yeah, the instant you take it, it's, it's copyrighted, all right. So every picture you've taken that's on your phone is copyrighted, all right. So you can take it yourself. What is another way of getting images? Other than purchasing a stock photo, we're going to forget about illegally downloading one and stealing them, all right, uh, taking pictures yourself. Sort of a third sort of way that kind of doesn't fit in either of those two categories. Does anyone know what Creative Commons means? Creative Commons. Creative Commons is where creators of work, whether they be images or music or, or any creative work, can say, you can use my stuff for free if you follow these restrictions. Now, sometimes the restrictions are you can use it for personal purposes but not for commercial. Or like if you're a nonprofit and you want to use a picture, you can use it, but not if you are a business that wants to use my picture. Or you can say, you can use my picture, but you have to give me credit. You know, and in that way, that's sort of a way of, of like promoting the person. You know, a good way for like an, a, an amateur musician or, or photographer or whatever to get their name out. Or you can say, you can use my picture, but you can't alter it. All right? In other words, if someone had a nice picture of a mountain, you could use it, but you'd have to use it as such. You couldn't take it and add Godzilla on it or something coming through the mountains or something like that. You'd have to use it as, as it was. And in a way, that kind of makes sense, not necessarily for the Godzilla thing, but if you imagine, you know, photographers strive very closely to get the lighting the way they want and, and the contrast and the saturation and, and, and all that. And if some goof with... Uh, Photoshop comes along and just wrecks the contrast and all that and makes it look like the person took a crappy photo. So, I mean, I can, I can kind of understand uh, that. How do you find Creative Commons images? All right. How do you find anything? You Google it, right? So if we go to Google and we type in Skiing. We go to images. We don't know at a glance if any of these are Creative Commons or not. But we can go into options and do an advanced search and say I want free to use, share, or modify even commercially. That's the most flexible form of the Creative Commons license. In other words, you can do anything you want to with this picture. All right? And I do an advanced search of skiing, and look what I get. Most of the ones that I see here aw, are probably at least as good as the ones that we see commercially. Oh, okay. We didn't see that one. I thought I had the safe, uh, I have the safe search filter on too. Oh well. All right. So that's another way. Another way that you can do it is that there is a, a uh, image site, Flickr, that you can also do a Creative Commons search on.
And you can do the same sort of thing. I want to filter by these things. Yeah, that's a nice one that you could use if you were doing a, a site. Um, you know, even commercially, you could you could use that image. So it's a good source. And and again. Um, the thing is, is with the internet, you know, there's more of everything. There's more great images and there's more crappy images. So the challenge is to sort of filter your way through. So the point is, is that um, if you don't think about it, it seems like, well, the only way that you can get pictures is go out and take them yourself. But what if, what if, you know, you don't have the time or the energy or you're not a good photographer or you don't have good equipment or whatever. These are some other options. Now, again, I do want to emphasize the fact that we're doing school assignments means that we have more flexibility and we can actually use images that we pull off the web provided that we give credit. But according to copyright law, regardless of what you've seen in any Facebook post or Tumblr post that says these images are licensed, uh, are, are being used for fair use, that's not legit. If you're using it for personal or commercial reasons outside of an educational context, then uh, you can't simply go random, you know, you can't simply go and, and, and pillage websites for images. All right. So what do you do once you got the image? All right. We're going to just look at some real, real basic image editing. All right. Essentially, you know, there's a whole realm of creative image editing where you go in and again, you make like a collage or a composite image or something like that. This class doesn't really focus on this, all right, this sort of thing. But there are some real basic things that you should, you should, you should uh, know how to do. You should know how, for example, how to crop an image. You should know how to resize an image. Um, maybe even play like with the contrast of it and so on. And you know, there's any number of tools that you can use. Um, I'm not even sure what's on this particular machine. We'll have to look. Sort of the granddaddy of all these is Photoshop, right? I mean, e even now, people use Photoshop like a verb. People say, someone Photoshopped that image. You don't know they Photoshopped it. They might have used another so application. Seriously. It's just like, it's just like people say, I'm going to Google something when I mean I'm going to look it up, right? Uh, I've heard people say, I'm going to Google that on YouTube. Well, no, you're going to search on YouTube, all right? It's like the whole thing with rollerblades, right? Rollerblades is not uh, a generic item. Rollerblades is a particular brand of inline skates. Inline skates is a more generic term. It would be like calling all cars Fords, all right? Um, and again, you might think that that's a good thing to have your brand known as identifying, but it isn't. Because if someone bought a pair of crappy inline skates and said these rollerblades are crappy, then you're besmirching the reputation of a fine company by saying that, all right? But this happens all the time. And again, I'm, I'm digressing. Today's my Friday, so I'm in a definitely a more casual mood. Uh, but like Kleenex, Kleenex is a brand name for a certain kind of tissue. Back in the old days, people would say the Frigidaire, you know? And boy, I probably am dating myself with that one, right? Because I don't even know if there is a Frigidaire company anymore. The point is, is that Photoshop is sort of the top line industry standard, but there's, at least in the past, there's expenses associated with it. And it's very complicated to use too. Um, um, let me rephrase that. There's a lot of features and it can be daunting. There is an open source alternative called the GIMP which you can use and you can download for free and you can use it and that's typically what I use. And then there's other simpler photo editors that will do just the very basic bare bones things. So let me look to see what kind of photo editors we have here. Paint, picture viewer, media center, don't know what that is, don't know what that is. Can you edit in any of these last three? Does anyone know? All right, guess we're stuck with paint. There's the duck. First thing I would say is if you have an image, keep the original. All right, keep the original like stash somewhere else. All right, 
Why do I say that? Why do I say keep the original? Just in case. Well, just in case of what? Well, as a backup. Is, I mean, you should keep... Yeah, you, you, should, uh, you, you should keep backups of all your files, by the way. But specifically with images, keep in mind that if I were to make this a smaller image, all right, right now it is, I don't know what the size is. What is this? This is resize. Right now it is 522 by 532, all right? If I make it 50% of the size, All right, and save it. I'm going to do a save as. So I made it half the size. If I look and I say, you know what, I don't want it half the size, I want it back the original size. And I go and try to re-edit it again, ain't going to work. Why not? Because, and it's a little hard to see probably on the screen, but we've lost quality of that. What used to be the smooth lines of the curve are sort of jaggedy lines. When you change the size of an image, when you lower the size of an image, you're losing information. All right. When you go and make it bigger again, that information is gone about how exactly the shape of the duck's head is. All right? There's less information stored about this image. And therefore, the photo editing software has to guess. And it's not going to do a good job guessing. And it will be visual. You know, if we want to do a more dramatic version of this. Yeah, it's Friday. We're going to have fun. Let me resize this. Let me make it 10%. All right? Little little tiny duck. Well, that's kind of cute. All right, let's save it. Notice I'm making it a lot smaller um, by making it, and again, that's a general rule of any sort of media that quality and file size go have a inverse relationship. The better the quality, or a direct relationship, the better the quality, the, the, the bigger the file size. So now we got our itty bitty duck. If we choose to make them big again, we can really see it's a, it's a blurry duck. All right. Or even if we do it again, all right. That's what I wanted to sort of show, and it might be a, large, a little hard to see. The edge looks fuzzy, and, and if you look on the monitor, the edge looks like squares. They call that pixelated, all right, because you can see the individual uh, pixels. So as a result, if we're going to edit this, we want to save a copy just in case, especially if we're changing the resolution of it. But it could be for other edits as well. You know, let's say if we made a black and white version of it and, and we decide, no, we want the color version. Well, if we save the black and white, we can't get the color back. All right, so that's the first thing is, is to do that. All right, now we can go and we can start putting the image on the page. Again, the file extension is important. What file extensions, what, what types of image files are there? There's JPEGs, PNG, SVG. Is that supported by all browsers? No. Okay. Let's, okay, right. Let, let's, talk about the, let's talk about the ones that are, are more, most universally supported. Pardon me? No. A GIF. All right. Um, and those are the three, and, and they all sort of have their purposes. JPEGs are um, uh, good for um, actual pictures, photographs. GIFs are good for like lawn dra line drawings, like if you had like a logo of something, you know, that wasn't a, a real image but had a, a line. 
And I do teach a multimedia class where we talk about like a little bit the, more the difference about this. If you're really interested, we can talk about it. Um, but uh, again, um, for photographs, typically we either use a JPEG or a PNG file. A bitmap, again, is supported in some browsers but not the others. All right. It does get confusing, though, because bitmaps can either refer to BMP files or it can refer to generic types of files like JPEGs, uh, PNG, and GIF, as opposed to SVG, which are vector graphics. Right. So, again, take the multimedia class if you want to hear, hear all that stuff. All right. So let's go in and let's put the duck on the page. That's, that sounds like that should be like a, like, a, like a slogan or something. Like, you know, like before the Super Bowl, they'll, they'll ask, you know, Richard Sherman, what are you guys going to do? It's like, we're going to go out there, we're going to put the duck on the page, you know. <laughs> or who is the guy, I'm only here so I won't get fined? He answered every question. <laughs> All right. Yeah, I'm really not either, but I did. One of my friends actually posted that status to Facebook, and I had no idea what she meant. So I like Googled, I'm only here because I don't want to get fined, or whatever the, the phrase was. And I saw, I guess there's one guy that doesn't like to talk to the press, but they're making them. So, all right. The image tag is an IMG tag. Much like the link tag or the href property, you have to specify more. You can't simply say I have an image because which image? Which of all the images on the internet am I going to use? All right? <laughs> all of them, right. All right? So you have to specify an additional attribute and that is the SRC attribute. Now, this is very similar to like what we do with links. In this case, because everything's in the same folder, all right, the duck image is in the same folder as first.html, all I have to do is put the name of the image, but again, I have to put the full name of the image. So duck.jpg. Remember, JPEGs can actually be JP, JPG, JPEG, or even JPE. So you, it's important to know the full file name. There is another attribute that I need to put on every image, and that is the alt attribute. The alt attribute is alternative text. And it will show up um, if for some reason the image can't be loaded. All right, so let's say that um, person that, you know, that's the admin of a website inadvertently deletes or moves an image. The alternate text will show in its place. The other big use for it is with accessibility. Um, people that access the screen um, via, um, via a screen reader, people that can't see, the alt text will be read to them. Again, poor substitute to be, to be sure, but it's better than nothing. So. There actually is, and we'll get, I think we'll get into this later on in the semester, there actually is where you can put a link as like a reference to go to, like if someone, if, if someone wants like the full story of it. I'm pretty sure, uh, unless that was removed in HTML5, and, or, or not removed, but replaced with something else. All right, so let's go and look at this. go. It's a big duck. Right. Now, if I wanted the duck smaller, well, no, no we, we won't ask that question right now. 
and there we go. Now, I can actually use images from other sites on the internet. I could put an image, you know, let's go and going to go and I'm going to put this image on the page too. And that works. All right. Generally speaking, you don't want to do that, though. That is called hot linking. All right. It, in a way, is stealing bandwidth from that other web server. So we made a request to LC's web server and downloaded that. What's another reason you don't want to hot link an image? Because if they change the URL, it's broken. What's even worse than that? They replace it with a picture of something else. You have a career in diplomacy if you want to, because that actually happened. A political candidate a few years back hotlinked to an image on some other site, and the person found out about it. I mean, it would be easy to see via logs like that, that, that it's being hotlinked to, and actually placed it with something that the candidate would not want to have normally appear on his site. All right? And again, it's like shame on you for hotlinking. You know, so you don't want to hot link. You're sort of at the mercy of them, and plus you're kind of stealing stuff. Now there are exceptions to that. What would be an exception to where it would be okay to hot link to a, an image? Pardon me. If it's in your own website or like your own account, like on Flickr or or Photo Bucket, if that's still around or or whatever, I, I can't keep track of all these. Yeah, I can't keep track of all these, but wherever people place them, Instagram, for example, if, if I think you can do that. But anyhow, if it's like your picture and it's on a photo hosting service, then the expectation is that you're going to do that, and that's okay. All right, and then you're in control of it, so you're not going to change the URL, and you're not going to replace the URL with something that you don't want to be seen. All right, so that would be okay. And... I, I always say that because a lot of people the first few times will say, you know, um, you know, will we'll hot link. And so I want to get this discussion down. So now, you know, if I say, hey, don't hot link, uh, hopefully you, you understand uh, what I mean. Again, I would put credit. And I would put credit even though you've taken a picture. Like, if I was going to do this, you know, I would put in the footer. Duck photo. Taken by author. LCC logo. Courtesy of LorraineCCC.edu. If you want to do the more legalese, you can say LCC logo used in accordance with fair use of copyrighted material within an educational context.
let's make sure the page still works. All right. So even if you take the pictures, it's probably good to give yourself credit just so I don't look and say, hey, you know, you use this picture without saying where you got it from. You know, if, if you might have some amazing shot and it's like, wow, you know, Ansel Adams took this and it's like, you know, no, you did. I, I, I got to tell you something funny. Again, Thursdays are my Fridays, um, so I, I, I feel a little goofy today. I saw someone I had a tattoo that looked, well, well, no, hold on, hold on. It was done in the more ornate script, uh, like, like the real fancy letters. I don't know what you call that. And I thought it was the LCCC logo. And I almost asked them, like, you got an LCCC tattoo? I looked closer, it was loco, L-O-C-O. -O. So it was like, I am so glad I didn't ask the person, wow, you must really love LCCC to get it tattooed. Now, of course, I want an LCCC tattoo in the same sort of script, but actually saying LCCC. I just might do that. I don't know. You, you never know. You never know. Yeah. I, I mean, they couldn't fire me after that, right? I mean, <laughs> I mean, come on, you know. It's kind of like the thing with Melt where, you know, you, you get a grilled cheese tattoo and, and they give you like a so much per, percent discount. Yeah. Yeah, something like that. Right. Yeah, something like that. All right. All right. Any questions about images? Any questions about images? Now is probably as good a time as any to talk about putting images in their own folder. All right. Remember I said that what I talked about either web pages or images that if they were in the same folder all you do is give the file name. All right. Well, you don't want to have a website where you have like a thousand files in one folder. Right? You want to divide your files on your website just like you would on your, on your machine. All right? So, how can you do that then? How can you do that and how can you put it in, in folders? All right? Well, you create a folder just like you normally would. One thing that we'll talk about later on is how you actually get this up on the web. Right? But right now we're talking about developing just on your machine. All right? You go and you create a folder. I'll create a food folder to put my food images in. I want to keep the duck where it is. All right, so I'll put the pizza image in here. And the pizza image is in the food folder. All right. Now, if I go and try to access that image. If I try the same thing I did with the duck, not going to work. If I simply say pizza, All right, <laughs> so we have uh, that image, and we go and try to view it, and it's not going to work. All right, because remember, we can only just use a file name if it's in the same folder. What do you get? You get that. You get a broken image. And actually, we're not getting the alt text even. 
Uh, that's up to the browser to display. I thought most browsers displayed the alt text, but I guess Chrome doesn't. If you see something like that, then something is wrong with the file name. And what are the common causes? Well, you could have typoed the file name, could have just typed it wrong. Pizzas instead of pizza or something like that. You could get the wrong extension on the file, like you thought it was a PNG and actually it's a JPEG. Or it's a JPEG and it has a JPG uh, uh, extension and you thought it had a JPEG or something like that. Or you could have it in the wrong folder. Now, for those of you that have done like command line scripting or anything like an operating system, the rules here are the same. If I, I'm going to use what's called a relative path to it. A relative path means I'm not going to put the whole C colon desktop slash blah, 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 blah. I'm not going to put all that. That's an absolute path. That's not going to work once I take this and go to grade your homework on my machine because I don't have those same folders. I'm probably going to be grading it on my Mac laptop. I don't have a C drive on my Mac laptop. So that's not going to work. All right. If you use a relative path then, as long as you keep the folders in the same position, then everything will be fine. So in this case, what you have to do is you have to map how to get from the web page to the image. How do I get from the web page to the image? I go down to the food folder, and there the image is. So the way that I express that in the code is I say, food slash pizza dot jpeg. All right. So the assumed starting point for this is the folder that the web page lives in. So if it's in a folder called food, you put in the name of that folder, a slash, and then the image. Now notice this is always a forward slash. I know you might say, well, what if I'm on Windows? If I'm win on Windows, do I use a backslash? No. You still use a forward slash because the forward slash is what's standard in a web environment. Regardless of what, where the files are physically, the web server, when this gets on a machine with a web server, the web server sees the forward slash as a, uh, as, as a directory separator. So even though you know, this is on a Windows machine, you still wouldn't use a backslash. And now, it should work. And there we go. Now, if we have other folders, like let's say we have a food folder, and because I like food, I have a million of those pictures, and I want to subdivide them even further, and maybe I put a snacks folder underneath that for snack images, then I would do what here? Food slash snacks slash pizza dot JPEG. So you can organize it any way that you want to, any way that makes sense to you, all right, and you'll be you'll be fine. Now now that we're going to get more involved in this, all right, um, you're likely to have more than one file to turn in for an assignment. All right? So, the best thing to do is to simply do what I did here. Put everything in a folder. All right? All your subfolders should be in this one folder. In other words, all your work should be in one folder. Don't have your web pages in one folder and your one folder on the desktop and your images on another folder also on the desktop. Have the image folder inside the web page folder. All right, that'll make your life a lot easier. So everything it should be self-contained. Everything should be somewhere in this folder or subfolders of it. Then you zip up the whole folder. How do you zip it up? On Windows, you typically can right mouse on it, say send to compressed folder, and there you go. 
and then that's what you upload. Now, a caution, because I get questions like this periodically, all right? Let's say that you download one of my examples. Let's say you download this example. And I'm going to go and delete that folder. Let's say I go and download that first example. Or you zip up one of your own assignments and you go back into the zip file. When you double click on this, it makes it look like there's actually files and folders there. So it looks like I should be able to do this and then double click and open that page and yet the images don't work. And again, IE does show you the alternate text whereas Chrome didn't. All right. So I typically, I, I often get people asking about this, like what's wrong? I, I completed the assignment, but when I went back to look at it, the images were gone. What's wrong is, is that even though this looks like those files are there, they're all crammed into one file. In other words, this acts like it's a directory, but it's not really a directory. It's just one single compressed file. And therefore, those images don't exist, all right, as a separate file. So what do you have to do? You have to, <coughs> you have to extract it. So click on Extract. That creates an actual folder that contains actual files. And you'll be back in business. All right. One thing to keep in mind is that I encourage you to practice these things even if they're not required for the assignment. So for example, I don't think assignment three has any images on it, but by all means, go and put, knock yourself out. Have a blast. Likewise, some students have been already trying some things with CSS based on what they know or they've asked questions, and that's fine as well. Next week, we will get into CSS, and that will give us so much control over our web page that we can, um, you know, that, that is amazing. So that's where we will pick up next time. All right. See you up in lab and have a good weekend. Questions in North Ridgeville? Are you okay? Nope. All right.